digital or physical room correction for stereo? All right. Yep. Um, this question comes to us from Harry in Belgium. And Harry writes, Hey, Paul, I've recently discovered your channel. Why, thank you, sir. And I have a lot of questions. Okay. But here, the first one is, would you prefer actual physical room correction, like uh, panels, floor treatment, wall treatment, and others, or would you be inclined to digital room correction? Since you have Class D amplifiers, it would be possible to incorporate this like Dirac or other digital systems. I think the latter are easier, but what, in your opinion, is a better way to go? I've been fairly vocal on this, on this subject for, for quite some time. I am not a fan of digital room correction, except on, at base frequencies. So at, at, at low frequencies, that's fine, because we can do things with, with digital correction in bass that doesn't really damage sound quality. I, I almost prefer not to, but, but we certainly can do that and get away with that. And, um, and in many cases, we can wind up with better sound than we started with. But as soon as you get out of, say, 100 hertz, 80 hertz or so, and go on on up, I don't like it. Now, I, look, I know there are some people, very well-respected, bright people out there making speakers and amplifiers that are digitally corrected so that it's perfect within the room. And I'm just not a fan. In the same way that I'm not a fan of a lot of feedback within amplifier circuits. Why? Because when we use feedback to correct something that is wrong, inevitably, we're compromising purity, okay? Inevitably. It's always better to make the original thing correct and right, and then do whatever you have to to make the whole thing work, right? So just if we just take an amplifier, if I have an amplifier that without feedback doesn't operate very well, I can wrap feedback around it and correct all of that. But remember, it's making a mistake and then we're correcting it. It's a band-aid. And band-aids have consequences. Okay? Now let's go back to digital room correction. If I'm if 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 my room is presenting frequencies like this and I take my speaker and I do the opposite of that, which is how digital correction works, so I wind up with a flat response in the room. Now my speaker is being required, instead of producing just a flat frequency response, it's being told to make all these anti-dips and bumps to correct for the room. And it'll never be as good as if you just fixed the problem in the first place. And in every case that I've tried, adding a diffuser, adding floor coverings and things for frequencies above 100 hertz or so, always better. The results are just amazingly good. It takes more time, it takes more work. It's not as easy as pushing a button and hitting a microphone, but damn, does it sound better. Always, always, always. Now, bass, I'm not going to ramble on too long here, I promise, because there's some cool little plants here, and our lavender is just starting to come up. Um, sorry, squirrel. Um, <laughs> the bottom end, bass, that's the roughest part in a room. And there's very little you can do to eliminate bass problems. And all rooms have bass problems. Just if you got four walls, a ceiling, and a, and, and a, uh, and, and a floor, you got bass problems, right? So. There's not much you can do about that. You do the best you can. And in my upcoming book, The Audiophile's Guide, I tell you how you can move back and forth and put your speakers in the right place to get, for your listening position, really great bass. But move out of that zone, and the bass is no good anymore. So it's, it's really hard. So there, there's a legitimate case for digital EQ, as long as you're not ruining the purity of the signal itself. And I think you can get away with it there, but generally, nah, nah, not going there. Okay, thanks. Glad I don't have any opinions. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.